Hello, everyone, and welcome to CodeCast by SDL Tech Talk, where we'll be giving you instructional, informative, unique, and insightful commentary on programming code and technology. From robots to roadhouses, we will be bringing you content you want and need. My name is JJ Hammond, and I'm joined by two coding experts. First, our guest for the show. He has pointed out the idiots of the week several times. He is a fire-breathing programmer that burns it up on Mondays, a geek podcast. He also went to film school at USC and spent time as a script reader in Hollywood. He has been featured on .NET Rocks. He also talks about the science of great UI designing. Motion control systems, my personal favorite, from the Ninja Turtle, Ninja Turtles on the soundtrack uh, back 30 years ago when that was a, a traveling show. Currently working on Code Rush, a suite of developer productivity tools for Visual Studio, the hilarious and brilliant Mark Miller. Say hello, Mark. Thank you, sir. Hello. <laughs> hello, and thank you so much for being on this show. We really, really appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. However, this show would not be possible without my co-host, fellow tech bro. He has spent the last 20 years architecting and implementing highly scalable ASP.NET applications throughout the Twin Cities. My good friend, Cosmic Coding partner, Microsoft partner from Minnesota, Gus Emery. Say hello, Gus. Hey, everyone. Mark, it's great to see you again, and let's have a good time tonight. Yeah, let's do it. Let's get this going. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Windows Phone, TuneIn Radio, or go to uh, our site and get the RSS feed to access the MP3s directly. Also, to note, STL Tech Talk is an experience. Anyone can learn about technology and what it has the impact on all of our lives. STL Tech Talk... We want to be your friends and family that you always wanted. Visit stltechtalk.com for a truly fantastic experience where you will find tech news, podcasts, codecasts, and forums, and coming soon are how-to tutorials on gadgets and software applications. Don't forget you can uh, interact with the show by sending us feedback to podcast at stltechtalk.com. And if you're watching us live on the show, you can uh, ask questions during the show in the chat room, and we will do our best to answer those questions. So, again, thank you, everybody, so much for being here. I can't thank you enough again, Mark. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with the first question, uh, wh which is on everybody's mind. What got you started in development? Um, well, I was really young. Um, uh, I was probably it was probably in about 1972, 73 time frame, and I had these uh, electronics kits from Radio Shack uh, that were teaching you, you know, NAND gates and and uh, uh, OR gates with lights and things like that. And I played with those for a while, and then I think when I was uh, around 16, uh, 15 or 16, um, uh, the the TRS-80 came out from Radio Shack. Nice. Clear when I asked, and you know, in, in the weeks leading up, there's no way you're getting that TRS-80 for Christmas. There's <laughs> no way you're getting a computer. Right. You know? And uh, and sure enough, I, uh, I Christmas comes and the computer's there, and uh, I look up at him and he's like, "Well, my parents got me a bike when I was a kid, and and they couldn't afford that bike, and they got me this bike, so you get that computer." So. So I started, I started, you know, writing games for it. And, you know, at the time, there was no way really to play games with the TRS-80. It didn't have any live keyboard input to control, you know, any kind of game. You couldn't do it. But I figured out a hack to make it happen with a with a character that I display in the upper right corner, and then I check to see what the character was. So depending on what keys you press, I just be in a loop checking that character and always positioning the cursor up in the upper right. So if you pray hit a key, I'd say, oh, you just hit the letter L, and I'd immediately move. And I and I and I was like thinking, oh, this is brilliant, this is genius. I'm gonna make a million dollars. I'm heading down to Radio Shack now. I get to Radio <laughs> Shack. I tell the guy who's working there, the clerk, right? I think he's you know Mr. Radio Shack. He's not. He's just a clerk. You know, he's just a sales guy. But I say, hey, I you know got this way, and you know really I figured this thing, and I'm gonna make a million dollars. And he's like, oh, but have you seen the new TRS-80 Model 2? It has the ability to get live keyboard input at any time. And I was like, <laughs> no. 
<laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> Throw up your hands in the air like the platoon movie. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so that was like you know my start. After about a few months of that, I it only came with like 4K of memory, and I created this game called Super Blockout, where you had four paddles moving around you know a middle area, and you had multiple balls bouncing around, and you had walls on the outside you had to break through. And uh, and I, I loved it. It was a fun game. But I felt like at the end of about four months, I was just hitting that 4K wall, and I was and I had totally, you know, explored and consumed the boundaries of that hardware. And and at that point, I was out of money, and I lost my financial backing from my dad, who was like, I had my bike for five years, you know. <laughs> and so so what I did then after that is like shortly after that the Commodore 64 came out and the Amiga came out but I couldn't afford them but what I did is I bought programming books and I wrote programs on paper for these computers because I was so crazy enthusiastic about it and that That's was awesome. that was the start and it wasn't until after I got out of high school and got into college where I was making some money that I was able to buy like a Commodore 64 and I was I was I was at the Air Force Academy, uh, and I, I wrote this game called Jogger. And Jogger is this this little stick figure that was jogging. And there was he, first he's in the streets of New York, and there are snipers that come up to try to shoot him because you know, that's <laughs> what happened in New York, at least back in those days, right? And so the jogger had to you know run and jump over cars, and uh, then he goes down to the sewer level, and there's a there's a level where the alligator comes up and it eats the little stick figure. And leaves his head, decapitated head, there with little crosses <laughs> right behind. And everybody loved it. It was it was awesome, and everybody loved this game. And I had it on a five and a quarter inch floppy, and my only copy was somehow destroyed, I think, or magnet demagnetized. And that's when I learned, you know, after months of working on the game, that backups are a really good thing to have. <laughs> so, so I kind of learned things the hard way, I think, right? But I've been doing this for like thirty years. <laughs> Whoa! You need to come back out with that game because God knows you could be the next, you know, Flappy Birds. Well, it was just—it was everybody loved it. It was incredibly, you know, gruesome on a stick figure level. So everybody <laughs> lit up when they saw it, right? It was, right. you know, there's blood. It was a there was a crunching of bone sound effect. You know, everything and uh, and and your little character just left with his head there. As the, <laughs> and the alligator, the alligator even got fat as it walked away. Right. It was, it was oh awesome. man, that is attention yeah. to detail, and that is awesome. Yeah. Is hot. So, so Mark, tell us a little bit more about your professional background. What, uh, you know, what okay. have you done in the past thirty years? Okay. Well, I um, so well, I did the Turtles, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, stage show. I did that. I my background's been fairly eclectic. I, I I always will will go and do something. You know, if it's if it's fun, and I and I I've had a gravitation towards developer tools for about, I want to say, 15 plus years, maybe 16 years. I haven't been keeping really good track of it, but it's yeah, about since 98, I think, I've been doing developer tools. And, um, and I love writing developer tools because I get to use what uh, the code I create, whereas most developers are writing code and handing it off to other users. I get to immediately enjoy the benefits of what I do and and also you know if it doesn't quite work out I, I I can throw it out instead of you know sending it out to customers or or whatever so sure. so there is so I've been doing that like I said for for about that long I've been I worked in Delphi for a bit Code Rush started in Delphi mm -hmm. um, I also created a product there called CDK the Component Developer Kit and it would make it easy to create controls for Delphi and I created a really cool interactive testing tool called React. Which allowed you to like uh, kind of essentially play with a control live at runtime and change its properties, look at it, how, what events are being fired. It was just a nice exploration tool and a great way to find bugs as well um, outside of what you would you, you might normally find using using other means to find bugs, such as test cases okay. or just giving to customers. Um, so and then I moved in 2002. I moved over to Visual Studio.net, moved CodeRush over there. And we've been doing Code Rush ever since in, in, in this world. So that's that's kind of where I am. Um, cool. So uh, I've got a secondary question on that because I think you're going to get into it right now from the direction that I hear. So what drives you every day to actually make your code? I know I've got a lot of developers that talk about burnout or block, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, writer's block, et cetera. What drives you every day and what do you strive for? That's a good question. So, well, okay, so there are there are there are things I'm working on 
that I can't tell you about, but I'll describe the answer with regard to those questions. And it, and it kind of goes like this. The, there's a discovery process, right? And to some degree, what, 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 what really thrills me is if, I've done, if I'm doing something that nobody has ever done before. Or alternatively, if I'm doing something that, if you talk to most people, they would think, oh, you can't really, there's no, there's, you can't really break through that. That's kind of a hard, hard, you know, hard, hard ceiling. And right. so, you know, doing the impossible is what I love to do. Doing what other people consider is impossible is what I love doing. And so, in 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 one of the projects I can't really talk about that I'm working on right now, I'm doing just that, and I'm exploring an area that I think a lot of people have put thought into. But I feel like a lot of people feel like there's there they we can't get any better than where we are right now in the current status quo, um, um, in this technology area, and um, and. And I think we're about to show everybody that that's not true. I think we're, you know, people are going to be like, oh, wait. Or alternatively, people say and say, oh, that's really cool and effective, but they aren't going to realize, you know, this kind of meticulous, you know, exploration and detail that, let, you know, exploration, meticulous exploration and the detail in it that, that led to it being as good as it is. Yeah, because the work is never done, and especially in technology. It's never, it's never ever quite finished and, and perfect. It's like art. Yeah, I I think you know when the way I work though, I try to actually make it so that pieces are done, and then I go on to something else. And then what you know what, what I love about you know what I'm doing now is if somebody comes along and says, oh, there's a bug in something that you wrote, Mark. I just say, hey team, there's a bug in something I wrote. Go fix that for me, because you know I'm over here looking at you know focusing on this next thing. And sure. so and so what's cool about that is that you know. I'm able to kind of say, okay, this piece is done and seal it away. I like to kind of do that. I like to make an interface so good the first time or maybe the second time or at the, at the worst the third time. <laughs> I like to make it so good that you can just, it just sits there and everybody looks at it and they're like, uh, okay, that's untouchable, right? In fact, in fact, when I get into Code Rush today, I'll show you, I'll show you at least one thing, actually maybe two things that I consider kind of untouchable, so hard to reach, took so much effort to get to, that I think it's going to take a while for other people to come along and copy those features. So. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things that drives me as well. Um, learning challenges, you know, making the impossible possible, right? And then yeah. it gets boring, and you go on to the next thing, right? And you, but you turn that boring part over to somebody else and continue on because if we get stuck with our own code at the end of the day for years upon years on end, right? How, uh, would we still be developers? Would we still <laughs> want to do it? Right. Well, I I kind of you know I don't know I th I think the answer is yes I think that you know the the biggest problem I have is when I have to go back to code I haven't written in a long time like years ago was the last time I touched it right Good point. then, then I got to learn the whole thing again but if it's if it's code that I'm regular main, regularly maintaining one of the things I do is I'm refactoring on the fly like all the time right so I'm all if I see a problem in the code I'm like fix the problem okay now get back to what I was doing like debugging yep. or whatever so the code doesn't get to a point where I'm ashamed of it or I'm like, I don't, you know, want to connect with it or it's hard for me to understand, right? I, I avoid that situation, mm -hmm. right? As soon as it even approaches or gets close to that, I'm like, um, I, I, um, I'm sorry, I'm just getting holy. I'm getting distracted. I'm going to take a 10 second break. I'm just going to close the door here and then sure. I'll hear that sound. And I'll no, that's. That's fine. Um, just to let our uh, listeners and, and watchers know uh, that uh, Code Rush, you can find www.devexpress.com. That's devexpress.com forward slash products forward slash Code Rush forward slash. You'll find a list of programs uh, that are useful there. Uh, and go ahead, Mark, go back into it. Okay, yeah, I was just like, you know, this is my brain. If I get distracted by anything, I'm like, oh, hold on, i got to go to address that. <laughs> All right. You are definitely a classic developer, Mark. Yeah, it's the, yeah. Same way, it's the same way with coding, right? If I go and I look at something and I say, this is hard to read, or this should be renamed, or this should be extracted to a new method, or whatever, I'm, like, I'm just it. like on it. And, yep. that's, and, 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 and the other thing that happens, right, is how do you get back on track quickly, right? Yes. And so there's... there's a lot of features I built into Code Rush, I built them on purpose so that I could refactor incredibly quickly and get right back on track without without losing my focus, right? With or with get or, or at least get back into the focus, trigger my focus again, and say, okay, that that's where I was, and keep going. Exactly. Perfect. 
Well, with so, that being said, why don't, why don't you get into uh, or get get ready to do this demo? Go ahead, JJ. Sorry, I didn't mean to step no, on. No, 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 no. That was perfect. I'm glad you said that. So, all right, gentlemen, what do we what do we in our audience need to make this uh, make this code run and, and function? What language is this code going to be compromised of? You're talking to me, right? That question's to yeah. me. Sure. Okay. So, 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 Coderish is a tool that sits inside of Visual Studio. Um, it's primarily geared towards C# -sharp developers and VB developers. So, there's no code that you need to get this working. It essentially helps you write code. So, that's that's the answer to that question. So, this is primarily for C# -sharp and VB developers. Also, if you're working in JavaScript or C++, uh, if you're doing XAML development, ASP.NET development. Um, HTML inside of Visual Studio. If you're working in Visual Studio, um, in any of those languages, there are benefits that Coderish can give you. Beautiful, beautiful. So why don't you go ahead and get us started? Okay, so um, I have got a, a little slides panel over the side. Coderish is easily extensible, and one of the things I created is a, uh, a tool window that shows slides as I write code. So as I make changes to the code, you'll see the slides update. I probably won't call too much attention to them, but they just will give you additional information based on what you're seeing. I've also <coughs> created some templates for um, uh, for the demo itself. So if you see these comments, C like C R one, that's just a template I've created just for the demo, and I can expand it and just gives me some code so I can very quickly kind of build up the demo pieces for you, and you can see those without having to wait waste a lot of time. Okay. So here's some information over here on what Coderish can do for you, and uh, and I'll first start out with talking about templates. I should also say that Coderish is built for a, a wide range of developer types. Um, templates are great for developers who know exactly what they want to build very quickly. They know they want to build a class, we want to add methods. They know those things all in advance. So these are this is what templates do, and they're 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 uh, pretty easy to get the hang of. It's pretty much just an abbreviation of the thing you want. It's radically different from the current way of writing code, um, and so sometimes people, when they see it, they're scratching their heads like, you know, that's really different. However, the payoff is extreme efficiency. There is no way to write code faster than this, and there won't be until we have, you know, uh, devices implanted into our heads um, that are actually reading our brain signals. Right. <laughs> so this is the this is the fastest way to write code until that 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 time occurs. Um, so if I want to create a new method, I just hit M and then the space bar or the tab key, and then I just type in the method name, like go fast, for example, and then I can just hit enter here. Now at this point, if you had gotten this far, you might think, well, I can hit the right arrow key. Why do you want me to hit enter, Mark? Well, the reason I want you to hit enter is because it's a bigger, fatter key than the right arrow key is. It's easier to hit. It's closer to the, oh, to the home keys as well. So just hit that enter key, and now I'm inside the parens. I can add any parameters I want here, and when I'm done, I just hit enter, and now I'm down inside the method, right? Essentially, four keystrokes plus what it took to type out go fast. That gets me a method. Um, if I want to create a variable, I can just use the letter V, followed it with a type shortcut like I for integer or B for Boolean. So, for example, if I want a new Boolean, I just type in VB like that, and, and that's my variable of type Boolean. I save a couple keystrokes. But let's say I want to have a new Boolean, for example, a new is initialized version. I can use the letter N. So NB would give me that, and it initializes it for me, like this. Um, I could have a new string as well, NS, and I can do this, right, for a new string. Or I can even have a new list of strings, and that gives me a new generic list, like that. So it's very, very fast, a new list of ints. All I'm doing is typing in ML.I, like that, and there's my new list of integers, like that. So it's pretty cool. If you are working in VB or you're working in both languages, the same keystrokes, actually let me come over here, I'll do the keystrokes over here so you can see them. Um, uh, I'll do it. Let's create a new method called go faster and we'll pass in uh, a string that'll be like the, the mode or something like that and we'll pass in a speed that'll be a double. So to do that it's very quick and fast. I'm just going to type in the letter M for my method. I'll type in go faster like this. I'll hit enter. Now I need a, a parameter that's a variable so I use the, the letter V. So I'm going to type in vs for variable type string, and I'll type in uh, the mode, and then I'll hit the space bar to get past that, and I'll type in vd for a double, and then I'll type in the speed. And then I'll hit enter, enter one more time, and I'm down inside. Right? It's a little bit different way of coding, right? But once you move to this, you start making fewer mistakes, and now you can get into a mode where you can now write code 
almost as fast as people can spec it out, right? And I've actually done talks in the past where I, I start the talk by saying, audience, you're going to tell me what code we're going to write, what, what we're going to build. Well, we're going to build a control, but you're going to tell me, you're going to spec it out for me. What kind of control are we going to build? And then I just build it out like that. Or it's good for, you know, uh, pair programming sessions or prototyping sessions or meeting with the customer, things like that. So you saw me just do that. I can do the over, move over into VB, and I can type in the exact same keystrokes. So just M the space bar, type in uh, go faster, like that, hit enter. VS, gives, and then type in uh, mode, hit enter. Space bar, VD, type in speed, enter, enter, and I'm inside the method. And there are templates for creating um, uh, for creating methods, the co you know uh, properties, things like that. And there are also templates for doing the insides of methods. Like if I want to create a try finally block, I just type in tf like right here, and it'll give me a try finally block. I can type in my code up here, whatever that is. When I'm done, I just hit escape to get down inside that finally block right in there. So those are templates, and those are good. Like I say, if you know what you want to write in advance. Hey, uh, Mark, real quick yeah. question. Um, so since these are all template-based, is it completely extensible then so I could put my own uh, object types or whatnot if I have a program that has a specific object that I've overwritten or whatever? You absolutely mm -hmm. can. In fact, let's do that right now. I love this. What's your object you want to create? You can spec it out, and I'll show you how to do this live and fast. Uh, let, let, let's create an IX, uh, a new version of iExtensible. So let's call it a more extensible. Okay, uh, I'm gonna call this I super extensible like this. Is this a class or is this this is a uh, an interface you want, right? Yeah, let's do an class? interface. Let's let's use it as an interface. Let's do okay. it. Either either way, you pick. All Your right, choice. so that's, I'll I'll just type in the letter I like that, okay. and then I'll paste in. I'll do that. I super extensible extensible like that. Perfect. Um, and so it's gonna descend from I extensible. Um, I'm just gonna copy that to the clipboard. And I'm going to use camel case navigation to just grab this middle piece and delete it. Mm -hmm. So camel case nav just allows me to get in inside into inner pieces there and get it. Nice. Um, that, that doesn't exist yet. Uh, we can go in and uh, let me just declare that real quickly too. I'll just come in here, yep. type in I, pop that in here. We'll give it one method, uh, do something. Perfect. Like that. Okay, enter, enter, like that. Hit escape to get down in here. What's it do? What do you need? You need some methods, properties? Yeah, let's have, let's have a speed property. And then okay. do something better property or uh, method. Okay, method, do something better. Yep. Like that. And then any parameters or we're done? Nope, that should do it. Okay. So so that's it. So you can you can you can create something like that. Now you want to use this now in the rest of the world that I just showed you. So what you do is you take your eye super extensible, you right click it and you choose use type and templates. And then you're gonna, it's suggesting use ISE as the, the shortcut for it. So I'm going to say add. So now that I've added this, I can now say, now let's say I want a new list of, of I super extensibles. I just type in N for, N for new, L for list, a dot, and then ISE. Nice. Very nice. Okay, so that's one way that it is, um, that it's extensible. But the other way is that all, so you can add any type once I've got this in here, so now I've got this ISE. If I want a method that returns a nice super extensible, I just type in MISE in the space bar or the tab key, whatever. Get it, like that. Okay, if I want to pass in a variable of I super extensible, I just type in VISE and then the space bar or the tab key, whichever one you've set up to extend it. You know, call this param or whatever it's going to be. Like that, okay? And if I want to, uh, if I want to create a new, you know, if it, whatever, if I want to create a property of type I super extensible, let me just throw a new exception here, so we're happy in there. If I want to, um, oops, let me do this. Okay, if I want to create a property of, of the same type, it's the same thing. It's like property of I S extensible of I super extensible, and then it gives me the backing store, whatever that's going to be. Awesome. Okay, so yes, it is it it is extensible that way. It's also extensible in the sense that I can create my own templates that do anything really in fact just to show you how sophisticated the templates can be let me jump over to this XAML application right here and you can create a template like this that does a G let's say we want a grid that's like a 3 by 4 grid I just type in G3 by 4 like that and then it's going to give me a, a it's going to build this out for me right here and so I can like, uh, say this is about 270 by 270 and uh, we'll make this uh, uh, each of these 90 right here like that and so now I've got my grid that I've just built, 
to bring this up full screen, and there you can see it. Right, so that was a template that just built this out, and it's a you know it's flexible, right? So that's it's gorgeous. It's that's just gorgeous. Yeah, it's possible to do the, a lot with templates. Okay, so by the way, I could go a lot in. I could probably talk for the full show just on templates alone, but I want to show you a couple other cool features. So if I may, I'm going to just move right along on those. Is that okay? Please. That is perfectly fine. And that's not to say don't interrupt me. If you want to, you know, if you want to drill into anything else. Um, Here's um, some code that is the, this is kind of the opposite of what we had before. Some developers like to write the consumption code first. Uh, for example, you might be creating a test case. Um, this is a common scenario in TDD development. Or you just might want to get a feel for what the user, users of your API might, what that code might look like. And that can often uh, lead to a better API. Okay. Or you might have like just copied this in from someplace and you it doesn't compile and you need coders to help you out. So I can just hit the code rush key on 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 this and I can choose declare enum. And there you can see it's built the enum for me. What's cool about this is it scans not only the line of code I'm on, but all the code around it to see all of those different pieces it needs to bring in. Um, the other thing it does too is it puts a marker so I can press escape to get back, which is very cool. I can stay here and I can work, and then I hit escape to get back. Now, I'm going off rails, rails a little bit to, to be critical and comment on every other way of refactoring for every other IDE, every other tool that's out there. And this is one of the things that really differentiates CodeRush from everything else. They show you a preview window. window. Here's what the code's going to look like. So now you have a constrained view in a window of what the code's going to look like. Number two, they generate it, and then you're on your own. You're still in the same place where you are. If you want to go make a change, you have to go find it. So both of those things CodeRush does not do. Instead, we give you the code. That's your essentially your preview. You want to make changes? You know, fine. If you want to undo it, you just hit undo, and you're back to where you started, right? But we instantly give you the code. There's nothing that we, no modal dialogues at all. Um, <coughs> and number... <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. And number two is we don't not going to we um, um, we give you a, a quick way back by hitting that escape key, right? You just hit that escape key and you jump right back to where you started. Here's another example of it. I'm going to just come down here. I've got some code that doesn't compile. I'll keep you know I'll continue in that tradition. Oh by the way, my favorite coders feature for sharp C sharp developers. I use it all the time. So here's what happened. I hit the open paren. Coders gives me the close paren. I hit the semicolon. Coders pops me to the outside. So that semicolon just saves me a couple of keystrokes, but I use it all the time. It's a nice, sweet little feature. Yeah. Nice, nice feature. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. So card doesn't exist yet. I put the, co the, I put the carrot on it. I hit the code rush key, which, by the way, you can change it to anything you want. I'm going to choose declare class. When I say change it, I mean you can remap that key to any key you want it to be. And now, again, it's scanned through the whole code, and it sees all the pieces that I need to add, and it's added them all together. Right, it's added them all here. I'm done. I, and, and on the right side, by the way, you can say, "Here's the code that we started with over here." I can hit escape to get back, and uh, you know, make changes. So it's very, very fast. All right, I'm going to do. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this. I was just going to show extract to interface, but I'm just going to um, skip through these. Uh, the main thing I was going to show there is, oh, you know what? Let's do it. What the heck? Because I just uh, let's do an extract interface first. And then let's come in actually, and let's say this thing is also using I super extensible, like that. Okay, we'll okay. use um, we'll use Visual Studio to implement that. Wait, why didn't it add, add anything for me? What Visual Studio should have given me that? I was expecting to add a method to it. Oh, there it is. It's right down there. I just didn't see it. Okay, <laughs> so um, let me do. Oh, speed. So check this out. So this is what Visual Studio gives you, right? I'm totally off rails, by the way, as you can, in case you can't tell, right? But here's speed right here, right? Check this out. Um, what is it? Convert to property with backing store. Nice. Boom. Nice. We already had a speed private variable. That's why you gave us speed one. We already had one in there called speed. So that just happened to collide because I was, you know, 
following uh, Gus's uh, suggestions with regard to what you know his spec. So um, so anyway, so we've done that. So let's uh, let me go up and change this speed to uh, we'll call this acceleration instead. Um, uh, acceleration. We'll just call it that. Okay. So we've got some, uh, and now let's go in here. Let's encapsulate the field. Okay. So we'll wrap a property around it. And then now let's come over here and let's choose Add to Interface. And now check it out. We can add this new public member to iCar, iExtensible, or iSuperExtensible. Oh, nice. Right, right? acceleration. That, that is that is awesome? high. So, so that we, goes right on over to the UI. Okay, that's, that's brilliant. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, so see what I'm talking about? Like really fast development. By the way, I love this. Can't we do this or something like this? Because it totally, when, when you do a demo that's on Rails, Right? Everybody's like, okay, yeah, you know, whatever, right? But when somebody starts coming in and saying, well, try this, no, do this, now do this, and you start seeing how fast and responsive it is, it is um, people start getting a sense of, okay, I get a sense of how powerful I can get with this, right? So you, do, you see, do you see, like, maybe, like, this being, do you see a lot of hackathon people, like, people that would use this to, like, you know, went over just because how fast and responsible, re responsive this stuff well, is. Well, it, it depends on what your what the hackathon is, right? <clears throat> you you generally hackathons have a domain expertise area that that is assumed. You know, right. there's something that's going on there, right? And they often involve UI, which is still slow to build, right? Right. So so you if 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 the hackathon involves you know a lot of code creation, then yeah, you are going to be able to write a lot of code if you're a competent programmer. You can win pretty easily if it's if it's ultimately down to a speed coding contest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, just just in general, like if you're just trying to like bang something, this is this is fantastic for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and you know, and the thing is, is like I'm using it all the time, right? And, and the thing I tell Code Rush users is, I say, look, if there's something you want to do, and it occurs to you that this is something that other developers would do often as well. Then we've probably got a feature that does it automatically. Just hit the code rush key and see what comes up, mm -hmm. right? Because what comes up depends on where you are. You know, as an example, I can be inside this double acceleration. I can hit the code rush key. Where do I have to be? Like right here? Collapse accessor. I was thinking that I could add a setter to here pretty quick, quickly here, but I guess I can't do it. I guess I have to do that with a template. So like S for setter, and then we'll say acceleration. We just set the setter. And now if I want to do an introduce setter guard clause, have you ever seen code like this that says if this is equal to that value, then get out of there because I might have some sort of time-consuming code down here, right? So that's an example of, uh, you know, of, of a feature that you know, is something that we do a lot of. Or yeah. we might have, I'm just looking for something with a lot of parameters here. I'm totally, uh, like I say, going off, going off rails. But let's say that our two suit, let me add a couple parameters in here. So just come over here. Notice there's no comma to the left. I just type in VS here. It adds the comma. We're going to cite right here, like name, for example, like that. We'll type in one more. We'll type in uh, VB, like uh, you know, uh, coded or whatever that's going to be. So now I can select these three parameters, hit the code rush key, and I can convert them to a tuple or introduce a parameter object, which creates a brand new object that has these three fields in it, and then changes all my calls to this, updates them to then pass in to take a new creation of this new class I create. This this is a phenomenal pro product. I mean, this is just a phenomenal product. Yeah. Well, thank you. All right, I gotta hurry because I'm gonna I want I'm gonna miss the really cool stuff if I keep if I keep going keep on this. We have uh, a color picker that is um uh, uh a to die, to die for color picker, and we have color swatches right in the code, so you can see what the colors are there. I just changed it to orange, and you can see the color swatch is orange. We see that this color is blue right here. We don't have to actually calculate that in our heads anymore. Um, there are lots and lots of features for working with strings. Let me just close this down a, a bit. And let's say we want to take this string, this concatenated string, and let's turn it into a string format call. I just call it use string format. Here's our preview window, by the way. It doesn't block the code. It's just whatever I hover over, I see a preview for what the changes will be. Nice. Yes. Oh, by the way, convert to integer. Have you ever had to do that? Math, oh, yeah. or math round, oh, those yeah. things are available as well. All right, let's use string format. Oh, let you know when we pass this double miles out, it's going to have like nine decimal places on it. Can anybody do a Google search for me, please, and look how to format it? Oh, wait, you don't really need to. Wait, hold on. That's not that's number two. That's not miles. That's my date time now. Let's go over miles is right there. Let's let's do a Google search and see if you can beat me on this. I want to get three decimal that's, places. That's slick. And I want to get a thousand separator. 
Okay, that's what I want my miles to look like right there. And I'm going to click OK, and there it is right there. I can do the same thing over here. Format date times as well, really fast and easy. Just get a custom date time there. There's my preview. It's real. It's all live. So if I give it stuff that doesn't make sense, right? Whatever, it'll it'll be like, oh, what are you doing, right? So it's all live live preview here. If there's an exception, let me see if I can get an exception. There you go, right there. So there's the exception coming up. Okay, so so it's all there, and then you can pop it in there. You can edit these as well. Um, I can split strings in half real fast and easy. Let's just take the string, split it in half. Look at what it does. You can see the preview hint, what it's going to do. See that? I can also come in here and I can say, let's grab a string and pull the whole thing, split that string out. Okay. Let's come down in here. I'm going to just do a real quick, uh, um, I'm going to say, uh, hello, Gus, like that. And let's say what I really want to do is I want to turn that into a uh, parameter that I pass in. Okay. Notice I've got the call to log no location right above here. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to hit the coders key. I'm going to choose introduce format item. By the way, notice it's not putting a string format call around it because it knows that right line already understands format items. Good. See that? Okay. Boom. Like that. Now I'm going to hit the coders key again a second time. I've only hit the key once. Hit the enter key. Hit it a second time. I'm going to choose for the parameter. Look at the preview hint. Nice. Nice. That up. And now I'm going to just call this name like that. And now I made the change. And now it's going to take me to every single call and allow me to modify it if I want to. Okay? Nice. And now I've, I've made that change in just a few keystrokes. Right? So things that you do all the time, right, are, 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 are pretty easy to do. Okay. I'm going to skip, I think, the test case, creating test fixtures. It's just fast and easy to do. If I want a new test fixture, letter T space bar will give me a new test fixture. If I want a new test method, Letter T, spacebar, will give me a test method, right? Its context is different depending on where I am, right? The templates are smart, and so they understand where you are. So as a result, you don't have to remember thousands of things. You just think, oh, yeah, I need a test method. I use letter T for that, okay? So, but I'm, Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. That, yeah, I mean, that saves time right there. One of the things that I, I, I will say with the test, with, the, with the creating test cases is CodeRush is framework, test framework agnostic. The same keystrokes generate the same fixtures and the same test methods, the same functional assert calls, regardless of what test framework you're using. Okay, does that make sense? So it totally decouples you. Just like we saw earlier that it decoupled you from the programming language. You saw me go over to VB. At one point in time, I was able to write VB code, but I wasn't able to read it. And that was because of Code Rush, right? I could write the code, and then I'd have to look at it and go, I guess that must be doing you know, what it is. <laughs> Eventually, I, got, I, 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 I came to learn how to read it. But it allows you to think in your favorite language while you work in another one, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, it makes it easier to kind of you know, branch off in, into maybe some other different types of languages, in fact. So yeah, I like, the, I like the coding agnostic piece because I've got people doing you know, new, uh, newfangled technologies and uh, languages all the time. This would make, a, make it easier for C-sharp developers to write other code. Yeah, it does make it the transition easier. It makes that transition easier. I wanted to show the code issues over here on the on the uh, code issue bar over here. You can see issues in the code. Here we've got an undisposed undisposed local variable. If I hover over the fix, you can see what it wants to do. It's telling me that data set is a is is a, is a uh, uh, of a type d is it, did the data I, set I disposable. Yeah, it, the data set variable is of a type data set the class which implements I disposable and it's not disposed in this block of code. And so I can introduce a using statement on it like that, wrap it up like this. Um, I just want to show you some cleanup that I do a lot. Sometimes I see code like this where I've got a for loop and I've got some you know, property access and indexer access and I see the same thing happening again and again inside well, the for loop. I know tell that. me this goes to link or something. If you no. tell me that, I'll buy it. Oh, no, this one doesn't go to link. What this will do, though, is it'll take this and it'll do an introduce method replace all right there on that, so I can now call this rows, this, and then I can do the same thing now on item array, you see it there duplicated, do the same one there and call it items, notice it added the braces for me automatically, oh, nice. and I took this code that was, that was somewhat inefficient and made it more efficient and easier to read. Oh, so this, that's nice. This is the kind of refactoring I do all the time, right? I see something and I want to fix it and I just fix it fast. All right, now we're going to show you some cool stuff that's, that's untouchable. And it's been untouchable for, uh, I want to say, uh, like about three years this has been out. So, um, so right here you'll notice I've got some code that we just added. And off to the left, 
there is a purple bar. And if you see a purple bar when you're using CodeRush, or you see this, that means you've got duplication in your code. This purple bar means this block of code is duplicated. In fact, it's duplicated with the one right beneath it. I put them both here for the demo, but they can be in different classes, at different projects, anywhere throughout your solution. Okay? So um, if you click this button down here, it'll bring up the duplicate code browser, and then you can come in and, and look at this. Um, uh, because of the screen dimensions, uh, I've got it uh, uh, resized a bit, but you can see it. this tells you just the severity of it. If it's bright red, that means it's pretty big duplicate block it found. Um, here's the code right here. If, if I hover over min, you can see, or, or max over here, min is highlighted on the other side. So it sees the variable name change. Um, it also sees, sees and pretty much holds irrelevant this, this bit of difference right here. Well, at least it appears to be irrelevant. It'll fix it in a second. But, but here, notice this block of code says if t is less than min, return t. This one says if t is greater than max, return t. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I have a different string here. Uh, and then different, uh, just some different formatting here. But this is essentially two blocks of code. Oh, there, and there's a comment here that says, oh, there's a bug here. So this code is actually, was, uh, we got this from uh, the Embraco source code, the Embraco open source project. Um, I made a, just a few, one modification to it. Primarily, I think I did this. I introduced a bug for the demo, and I added this line of code, the console right line call. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, otherwise, it's untouched. And this was something that Coderish found. And Coderish can actually consolidate these. And this is where it gets cool. So I can consolidate to the current class. Imagine if these were in, uh, in, in two different classes in two different projects. Coders can actually create a new project that's used and referenced by your current project, by the other project, modify the references in the project so they reference the new project, modify the import statements so they're used, referencing the new file we're creating, and modify the inherent the ancestry so that it's uh, the classes. Uh, well, in this case, it's a helper, but it can be an ancestor as well. So, so, and it can modify all of this that can take, you know, up to 10 minutes of error-prone, tedious, meticulous work and do all of that. And Coderish is the only tool that can consolidate duplicate code that I'm aware of. I don't know of any other tool that's been able to do this, and we've been the only tool that's been able to do this on any platform for, um, uh, uh, like I say, about three years. There, and, and I will say there are some cheap tool, tools that do cheap consolidation. In other words, they don't do a, a strong understanding of the code consolidation, um, uh, and, and they don't come anywhere close to what CodeRush can do. So, yeah. so here, for example, I can change this to find edge. Um, I can come over here, and I can uh, rename this, uh, this function. I can call it uh, is uh, edgier, for example. And so I've got this is edgier function. You can see down at the bottom here, these are my calls. And what Coderish has done is it's taken out the differences and passed those in. So see how it's passing in the function right there for the two different differences? So now I have two methods, max and min, that call this main big block of code. I have, now instead of having it copied, it's in one place. I can come in here. I can, I can clean this code up in here. Call this, for example, call this edge, for example. I can come down in here. I can fix this bug, um, that sort of thing. And I can add new things to it. I can add logging and all of that. And instead of working in two places, I'm only working in one place. That's right. beautiful. I mean, just the ability for it to automatically reset those other, you know, variables and calls. That's that's fantastic. All right, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going to show you two more features. I'm going to try and finish in like four minutes. Do I have four minutes okay. or no? You got four yeah, minutes. No. Okay, four <laughs> minutes. Here we go. Um, these are these are both really cool, and they 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 help you in the debugging zone. Um, by the way, this is a uh, this is not a shipping build I have. Everything I'm showing you is shipping, with the exception of this really cool icon, which is going to ship soon. But this is a feature called uh, the Debug Visualizer. And when you click it, I love the icon. It goes to the 50 style um, 3D glasses over here. And what it does when it's on and you're debugging, it shows you, for example, the values here of your parameters as you're coming in. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to, like, for example, we go over here in the locals. We could have that window up, but we have to move our eyes down low to see them. And they're listed in, in I think, alphabetical order. But up here, mm -hmm. they're right next to the pieces that, where they are. If I hit F10 to step into it, I see the result of the, the return value before that code is executed. Nice. Right? Isn't, that, isn't that cool? I don't, does Visual Studio do this? Visual Studio, I thought, did this, but they're not doing this. I've got 13 up. And, and I'm not seeing it. I thought it, they, you they have added to hover, it. You have to hover over it. Highlight it and hover over it, and it should do it. But that's oh. beside the point. Highlight, hover. And then it should. But then uh, again, CodeRush might be taking over. But yeah. I don't think, no, I don't think we're taking I over on that. But I, I don't but, think so. 
Anyway, so, so they're supposed to be showing to you, but if you're using an earlier version, Visual Studio doesn't have it. Code Rush will add that to your earlier version of it. Um, I wanted to show you this, though. A lot of times people are like, well, why is this 5? You can hold the Alt key down, hit down arrow, and now start drilling into it. So I can see, oh, the inside's 25. See the math call square root there. Mm -hmm. Or I can hit the down arrow and start drilling down. Oh, it's 9 plus 16. Or I can drill down and say, oh, it's 4 times 4. Right? And I can see all of the pieces of it very quickly without moving my eyes away from the code. Let's nice. hit one and keep going yeah, here. That is very nice. I'm gonna do, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and run through. I'll show you that one other come in handy the other day for me, actually. Yeah, me too. Here's a cool feature uh, called dead path de-emphasis. So the idea is we are on an if statement, and Coders is gonna tell you if you're not going into where you think you might be going by taking the block of code you're not going into and de-emphasizing it. It's a dead path. Right oh, in nice. there. So this is, this is really useful if you've got a giant block of code and you're expecting to go in there and you before we even execute the line of code, we're telling you, hey, uh, you're not going there. So now you Sorry. can say, wait a second, let's, yeah, let's drill in. Because what happens if you don't do it, you hit F10 and you're now hundreds of lines away maybe at the other side of the EFLs. Right? And now you have to go back up. It slows you down. So why is this false? Well, if I drill down into it, I notice that this one right here is green and bold, and the others are not. This one is why its parent is false. So now I can, I can hone in. to, to I, It gets my eyes in on why is this false. I want to be able to rent a car. Well, here, customer accident count is less than min accidents. I can hover it down here, and I can see, oh, the customer has five accidents, and our min accident count is three. That's why this is false, which is why this is false. Okay, does that make sense? We totally. highlight the, totally. the, the expressions that are causing the parent Boolean to be what it is. Yeah, okay. Let me show you, I'll show you one more feature. <laughs> Here we go. All right. This is a uh, tool that finds prime numbers, and uh, I'm just going to run it and run it, and you'll see that it's got a bug. It finds 2 and 3, three, but it also finds 4 and 9, which are not prime. So it's got a bug. Let's run through it. I'm just going to step through here. I'll show you the debug visualizers we go through. You can see, oh, found position is 4 there. It shows you the values of out, out parameters. Um, let's see what, I want to see if what's going on over here. Okay, so, so look at this. So you can compare it with what's in Visual Studio here as well. So Visual Studio does have it, right? But you've got to, like, you know, move the mouse down, get your eyes down. And here, it's right next to it, right up there, mm -hmm. right? So you've got that advantage. Dead, path, dead code path, the emphasis. Here's the result of what the string format call is going to be, et cetera. Right, let's keep running. Come down here into search primes. We're going to come down here. Let's just step through the code. You get a history of what's happened, and you get a preview before, right? So you're seeing into the past and the future with this product. Now we're going to uh, step into this, and I'm just going to step into this. That's Visual Studio. Uh, and uh, and I'm just going to hit F10 on this, and let's actually refresh this and see what's going on. Let's drill into this. I'm passing a 1 to it right here. I'm going to set a breakpoint right here on this line of code, and there you can see my breakpoint right on that expression. I'm going to hit uh, uh, F5 to run, and there's, there's prime 2. That one came back okay. 3 was good. 4 was false. Let's step into it, and now I'm inside of it. I don't want to debug this right now. What I want to do is create a test case for it. So I'm just going to hit Control Alt Shift T, and it's just built a test case for me over here. Well, it's kind of built a test case for me. Uh, it's going to when we're done. It can't actually generate any code right now, and I'm just going to say four is not a prime, like that. Okay, so that's my remark there, and that's my test method. I can change what class test class I want to put it in, what class test project I want to put it in, that sort of thing. I'm going to keep running, and I'm just going. To, by the way, notice we drilled down and we. We expanded this. When we come back, it keeps that expansion open. This is actually very, very cool in that you can be, if you're, if you're expanding out to try to understand what's, what's happening, the next time, and you set a breakpoint on that line, the next time you hit that breakpoint, all that expansion exactly as you had it is going to be back out again to help you debug. So six, seven, eight, nine was a problem. Let's step into there. I'm just going to quickly hit Control Alt Shift T again. Here's our new method down here. I'm going to give it a good name this time. I'm going to just add the word nine. Say uh, nine is not a prime either, like that. And I'm going to stop debugging. 
and now the unit test builder comes in and it adds to our existing uh, test class these two test methods. And what's really cool about this is, is it's smart enough to check to see if the test class already has an instance of the thing we need. And in this case, it did. So we just borrowed that reference in my test methods. Okay? Does that make sense? Instead of building and declaring a new one, because this, all, this code up above already existed. Mm -hmm. This was already there. These are the new ones I've added. It just borrows it. And now all I have to do is come in here and come in and, and, and uh, type in like AT for assert true. That's a coder's template. Let me get my mouse out of there. And then uh, there's my, uh, whoops, I don't want to do assert truth. I want to say uh, AF, assert false, because four is not a prime. And then I want to come down here and do the same thing, right, like that. So there we go. That's my rushed high-speed code rush <laughs> demo. Yeah. Rush, rush code rush demo. That's it. It was wonderful, and I think uh, I think a lot of people are going to get something out of this. Uh, I know I, I have, but uh, this is. I mean, it was beautiful. It's fantastic. I mean, great presentation. Thank yeah, you. Sir. Great. Great job, Mark. Thanks so much. Um, so, where can people find further information about Code Rush? If you go to devexpress.com slash coderush, you can go there. You can also just you know, do a Google Bing search for it and, uh, and type in coderush, code and it's probably going to be the very the top hit. Okay. So, yeah, sounds perfect. great. Sounds yeah, so um, where can uh, our audience follow you or see you or stalk you or whatever the case may be is? Yeah, you know, I think the best place is Twitter. So I'm at MillerMark on Twitter. I think you've got it right here on my... Uh, Mm -hmm. Like right there. Is that right? It's right down there? It is right down that's there. Right, right down yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> so at, at Miller Mark, the best place to stalk me. That's NSA stalking me there as well. So, you know, it's the it's the place to be. Anybody who's anybody is stalking me on Twitter. Nice. So. Nice. Yeah, nice, nice. So, uh, so Mark, I'm going to ask you a quick question here. I've asked a couple other guests um, similar questions, but what do you see as the next technology niche? Okay. Yeah. So, so there are so so I should I I, I want to say caveat big caveat on this is that I'm not looking wide I'm very focused right? right and so and so this is one of probably a thousand niches that are coming but I'm a huge fan of collecting metrics I think the more data you have about an interaction with a customer for example okay. the the better you can design your product your service whatever it is. Right? right right now, website developers have essentially access to the richest collection of metrics of probably any service provider. If you want to call a website designer a service provider, right? If somebody who's building a website, you know, uh, the customer-facing website, something that's facing a lot of people, you have the ability to collect more metrics and to do A/B testing than anybody else. But but what what I envision a world where Folks who are do, don't uh, who operate a business that that's like not only on a website but maybe also in the real world or operate a service in the real world, having the ability to collect metrics on us an experience. For example, going to a theme park or shopping in a department store. For example, going to IKEA, right? That sort of thing, right? Sure. Collecting metrics as the customer walks through the store or walks through the physical location. What what you know? What's happening right now? Are you enjoying this? Or are you not? Right? Or is this good, or bad, that sort of thing? What I envision and have absolutely no time to work on, so I'm kind of just giving this you know billion dollar deal out. To, you know, whoever grabs it first, is essentially a a, a service and a, a a mobile app that's really nice that allows people to to essentially very quickly dial easily dial in their 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 feeling. Is it good or bad? Right, really. And now what I can, and 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 couple that with with precise location where you are within the, within the store, which is technology that is expected to be widely available on phones, like in the next year or two. Okay. Sure. <laughs> sure. Something, something like that. Like I say, year or two. I'm. That's my expectation. Nobody's told me that. There's a St. Louis company. I want to say all maybe all all lanes or something like that. They, that's kind of trying to do that right now um, in that space. But I love your answer. Uh, I, I, I listen to a lot of people and what they talk about and, and the next things. Uh, but this, you know, that that was a good, like you said, a very niche 
answer, but a very, very good one. Very good. There you yeah, go. Definitely. Yeah. Totally agree with that. So, my sense is that there are a lot of companies that, if they could get metrics easily, right, do it. And this kind of writing the software that does this, that gives a good user experience, right? It's got to be easy, right? Yeah. There, this is something that politicians have been doing for years, where they get a whole bunch of people in a room. The politicians delivering a speech, or or not the politician, but the but the, you know the speech writers there, or or the representative, and he's saying different words. What do you like? Do we like estate tax? What do we hate? Right? Death tax? You know, what do we? What do you like? What do you hate? And everybody in the room has got a dial, and they can just quietly dial up or down whether they like or hate something, right? And mm -hmm. it's incredibly powerful metrics, right? They can show them a, vi a video, right? Show you, play yeah. a song for you, right? Right, and, right. And live, get that metric data. And what I envision this company is being a specialist in is supplying both live data and making it easy for anyone to collect live data, right? If I wanted, for example, to collect live data on this podcast and this company existed, right? Right. It should be it should be just painfully easy. Anybody wanted to participate could get the app from downloading the app. They get some sort of bonus, like a discount on Code Rush or whatever. It yep. would be that's how I'd envision it, right? Sure, and, sure. And live, you could get live feedback for when I'm when I everybody I just kill everybody and they hate the show. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, oh, right. Mark should not have told that joke. That was the one that crossed the line, right? Right, right. <laughs> that, that was the one that tipped the scale, and all of a sudden you just see like the, you know. Right. The, the downward slope, uh, the ski right. slope, if you will. Yeah, it's kind of like I don't know if you guys. So if you're, you, I don't know if you're old enough for this or not. If you're in the United States, if you're not in the United States, or you're not old enough. You, you won't know what I'm talking about. But there was a show, a long time ago, called the Gong Show, where people who wanted to be comedians would go up and entertain, or or, or any kind of, you know, do any anything, and well, anybody could come up and just gong them, and you know, any of the three judges could gong them, and they'd be out. And so this is kind of like you could do it like that, right? If, if right. It, Wild enough response. All right, you're out. We eject this person. <laughs> <laughs> they can. It's it, you know. It's kind of. It can be kind of creepy too, right? Where it's like the people and the because you can't see them, so like they're all dark and like it's just you know big spotlight coming down on the guy and he's like you know doing this thing and all of a sudden the next thing you know like the 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 trap door falls beneath him and he falls to the. <laughs> <laughs> you know what right. I'm but yeah. I mean, I could see that being a second screen experience too, uh, Mark. You know, like watching the metrics on, like maybe like you're you're you get you know you're watching us right now. Let's just say you got a, like Chromecast or the TV or whatever, and then like on like a tablet or something, you're watching the metrics of the show. You sure, know, sure. something like that. That would be pretty hot. Yeah, that yeah. Would be no, cool. I, I want this actually. I want metrics like this for the plural site course I'm I'm creating. I want to know if there's a point where I'm starting to lose people or people are starting to you know maybe not understand something. Right. I, I want these kind of metrics and I want them. I want them in two forms. I want them. You want them. You know. I guess three forms. You want them live while it's happening. You want them tied to a recorded broadcast, like a recorded course, like the plural site course. Or, for right. example, you know, a recording of a song or a you know, music video or something like that on YouTube. You want them so recorded so that I can then look at a heat map, like where am I losing my YouTube visitors at, right? right. Yeah. right. And you want them, you want them collated over time. If you're like a, you know, a theme park or a department store, but sure. all of yeah, that makes sense. sense. From my perspective, there's kind of a power vacuum right now, and there's an opportunity for someone to come in and take this just the whole thing. And like I say, it's probably a billion dollar idea. So that's my gift to you guys. I think we've, <laughs> we've specced it out right here. It's just, yeah, I know. We've totally just laid the, <laughs> like the boardroom and stuff rush. done. All you need to do is get Code Rush and then write it. And right. it'll be you know, submitted tomorrow and you'll be done. The, the, the money will be coming in, kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, well, Gus, why don't you go ahead and take us home with the applications uh, packages of the week. Sure. Um, my application package of the week is Azure Multi-Factor Authentication SDK. And the yeah, reason cool. I'm bringing this up is because there's been a lot of buzz in the last six months about computer and website security, um, personal security, payment security, healthcare security, etc. Well, what this allows you to do is easily use Windows Azure to do a multi-point or multi-factor authentication, which would be either an email, a phone call, a text, or whatnot to either a, a 
a uh, known email address or a known phone number, mobile number for the text, and allow you to re-enter the, the digits that you have gotten or the code. And we've all seen this actually working if we have a Surface or a Windows 8 machine and we right. log into the second or third version of it or the you know a new machine or whatnot, Windows... Uh, Windows or Microsoft will actually come back and say, should we text you at the at the number ending with XXX and gives us a code and then we log in to authenticate to make sure that we are who we say we are. And I see this getting, you know, uh, kind of blowing up in the future and a lot of people starting to use this. And it was brought to my attention for another reason. Um, and I, as I looked at it, I said, you know, this is really cool. They've, they've actually upgraded it from the last couple of versions. I, I've started to actually to look at it. So I might be able to give a little bit more um, information on it in the future. But I think it's something to actually look at and play with, especially if you're doing mobile applications that really need good authentication. Yeah, and I see here that it shows that it's iOS, Android, Windows Phone, all that. Uh, it works with all that stuff, so that's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, it, it supports just about anything you can do. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, uh, so I should say that it's available for both uh, C Sharp, Visual Basic.net, Java, Perl, PHP, and Ruby, which pretty much covers just about any <laughs> that application that you can of think of. Yeah, so right. uh, that's pretty good. JJ, why don't you cover your app of the week? Yeah, so uh, mine's the uh, Nokia Imaging SDK. Uh, if any of you know me at all, I'm I'm huge on Nokia's um, you know camera software, uh, Nokia designs, and all those kinds of things, and their uh, their their developer tools. Uh, but the Nokia Imaging SDK is now out as 1.1 version. Uh, brings technologies that uh, Nokia can can use to uh, implement uh, filters and screens to high res. Uh, Photos, you can use C Sharp, C++ even. Uh, with the Quick Start Guide and the API controls, it's really, really easy to implement and do. Uh, it's a single co code base. The API surface uh, between Windows Phone and Windows is, is, is shared. So if you're familiar with the imaging SDK on Windows Phone, uh, you know how to use it for Windows. You can also share a lot of code beneath the UI layer. Uh, what's really cool here in the new filters and effects is the HDR effect, interactive foreground and segmenter, and lens blur. Uh, you can go to to uh, Nokia Image or Imagine 8, and uh, you can see just different things what they're doing right now in that space. And I just think that that's really cool because I'm still waiting for more augmented reality stuff to keep coming uh, in the future, uh, especially with some of the you know the, the Google's uh, different um, uh, things with the 3D mapping inside. So I'm really curious about these SDKs and making sure I stay on top of it. So that's my pick of the week. Yeah, and as always, to our viewers and listeners uh, at home, uh, whether you're live or recorded, um, these links should be with our show notes at stltechtalk.com. So. They will be. Absolutely, they will be. Um, so, Gus, did you have anything else to add? Uh, not in the applications part, but I just wanted to let our users and, and everybody else, or our viewers know that I'll be at the uh, Nebraska Code Camp in Lincoln, Nebraska at the end of March. Uh, I've got a, a four-hour MVC workshop that I'm doing. I've also got one other session, I believe, on Saturday. Uh, and I will be at the Build Conference in San Francisco, April 2nd through the 4th, uh, walking, around, yep, walk, walking around, talking um uh, watching uh, some of the announcements, and we'll be uh, we'll be uh, doing daily recaps on this show um, and other shows just to to do that. We also have two upcoming shows. Uh, Mike Benkovich will be doing some uh, Azure mobile service uh, demonstrations uh, in two weeks, and Brian Randall the week after Build. Uh, we're going to do a kind of a recap on Build with some of his thoughts and whatnot. So, those are the two upcoming shows that I wanted to plug right at the moment. JJ, no. do you have anything? No, that's beautiful. No, there's there's a, a lot of stuff that, that's coming up, and mostly I just wanted to keep the focus on what you had going on because, guys, we are going to have some awesome, uh, you know, on the ground experience from Gus, you know, and, and his uh, his insane uh, intelligence, and being able to meet with some of those other people and just talk to him about the different stuff that's going to be be happening. Uh, we're going to be at KCDC. Uh, we're going to be at uh, just a whole bunch of other events. So just go to STL Tech Talk, uh, email the show, follow us on Twitter at STL Tech Talk. Um, so we we. Yeah, just just go there. Uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. Mark Miller, thank you again for being on the show. We, we can't thank you enough. I love Code Rush. I'm I'm I, that that's a phenomenal tool. I hope everybody checks that out. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, thank you to all of our fans. Uh, we love and thank you for your support of the show. And uh, from the entire STL Tech Talk crew, uh, we are with you in the debugging zone. <laughs> that's it, guys. We're out. All right. 
Thank you.